Mesdames et messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, veuillez accueillir, please welcome José Viegas. Good morning. Bonjour. I want to start by thanking Michelin for inviting me here and thank you for being here with me. I'm going to present you something around the same topic of urban mobility, but from a different perspective, that of a think tank dedicated to public policy. We will bring together elements of technology, of consumer preferences, and of public interest, and try to do that in a holistic approach. First, some background. There's a very strong growth of urbanization, as we all know, but probably some of you have not yet been aware that the intensity and the speed of that is huge. Over the next 30 years or so, we will have 2.4 new billion urban inhabitants. That's a 60% increase over 30 years. It's absolutely massive. And if you look at the mobility of people, it's not only more people, but more mobile people. The expected growth under the business as usual is 140% growth of passenger kilometers. Most of this growth will be coming in the emerging economies. The share of total urban mobility of the OECD countries is today 45%. It will go down to 25%. Not because the people in the OECD countries will move less, but because the others will be growing so much. The mobility in general, in person kilometers, in the business as usual, is expected to grow by 135%. But in car, because of increased car ownership, again, in the business as usual, is expected to grow 185%. So that's almost three times as much as today. If we look at the large cities across the world, we see that there are some common problems, whether it's a rich country or a not-so-rich country. You have problems of congestion. It's the number one mentioned problem in all surveys. Then you have problems of poor access by public transport and not so good service. Then you have low air quality, and then you have traffic safety. All of these four are common to all large cities. But then you have some important differences, particularly in what comes to be the resistance to change. How can we get out of the business as usual scenario? And if you look at the large and the big countries, the main cost is what I'm calling legacy and inertia. Why? Because over the last six, seven decades, our cities, the urban landscape, and our own lifestyle have grown more and more aligned with car ownership. So getting out of this framework will have difficulties. If you go to the emerging countries, it's another problem. It's their aspiration to have a car. They have been saving to have a car. They dream about car ownership. And it's not easy to tell them, no, 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 that is not sustainable. Give it up. So this will be a, a big difficulty. In the one case, you have the real world difficulties. In the other case, you have the virtual world realities, what people have in their minds. But if for the lower income countries, you have to have also in consideration that you have much worse road safety levels, and often, another problem, less mature institutions. So how do we go about this? We're calling it a new approach. As you will see, there are elements that have been mentioned in many places. We're just trying to put them all together. This comes with two key concepts. The first one is focus on access, not on mobility. The real raison d'etre of transport and mobility is to provide you access to your job to the public services, to local, local social interaction. This has now been recognized in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Access is mentioned in three or four of them. In a report developed for the UN Secretary General, in which I was very proud to take part on sustainable transport, access is the key word. In the UN Habitat 3 New Urban Agenda, access is again there. But curiously, it's not yet reflected in the official practices for cost-benefit analysis in most of the developed world. We are still focusing on time savings. And that promotes speed, and that promotes car ownership. 
The second key idea is that there will be so much change, and you've heard about it this morning, that we should leverage on those coming changes to radically reorganize the mobility system. Whether we like it or not, those changes will be coming. So as you're moving in this direction, give it a little twist and you can re reorganize it in a much more efficient and sustainable way. These are the two key concepts. I will now be talking to you about the impact chain so that you can see how complicated it can be and how, depending on small decisions, you can move in one direction or in another. So bear with me with this little graphic thing. The three elements that all of you are familiar with are the digital connectivity, the electrification, and the automation of the vehicles. Now let's look at some of the consequences. From electrifications, we know we will have lower emissions. From automation, you will have better road safety. But also, you will have a lower perception of in-vehicle time because you can be doing other things. From digital connectivity, we already observed today preference to sharing and fruition. But if you take a little further inspection of what are the consequences, you see, for instance, that by having electrification, you will be losing a lot of the fuel duties, which are an essential component of fiscal income in so many of our countries. Bring it together with digital connectivity, and you can have a change in the fiscal regime of road transport. By bringing the digital connectivity with this new preference for sharing, you can have very attractive ride-sharing services. By bringing digital connectivity with the automation, you can have much lower cost of the professional cost, uh, ride services because the driver typically represents very close to 50% of the total cost. By bringing together the preference and the, for sharing and the attractiveness of those services with a lower cost, you will have a lot less need to own a car. And several of the previous speakers have already very clearly mentioned that this is something that all OEMs now recognize. The problem is that if you have this, with a lower perception of in-vehicle time, it's very easy to imagine that the number of vehicle kilometers could be divided by two or multiplied by three. So how do you solve it? It's not easy, but there is a key variable that will make that choice, and that is called vehicle occupancy. If we go to mobility as a service based on rides of people at the levels of occupancy that we now have in our private cars, mobility, number of vehicle kilometers, will double. You will have a very green congestion because all the vehicles are electric, but a very tough congestion. To get out of that problem, you have to have higher occupancy. So the shared rides must be with multiple occupants in the vehicle. The three main instruments to address this that I'll be covering start exactly with this, shared mobility. In there, I'm showing two covers of reports that our institution, the International Transport Forum at the OECD, I'll be calling it ITF, we have published the one on the left a year ago and the one on the right just two weeks ago. And on those, we have been looking at the, the impacts of organizing shared mobility in a city. We use the data of Lisbon, my home city, because I had the data my, my previous life as a professor there. And we looked at that and we saw that by organizing it in two segments of supply, one, shared taxis with a service as your regular taxi, door-to-door -door service, but accepting that you may have a detour to board another passenger or to alight another passenger. And then something we call taxi buses, which are demand-responsive small vehicles they don't take you to your door, but you pick it up and you get alighted at the street corner no more than 400 meters away from where you are. But no transfers. Both on the taxi and on the taxi bus, no transfers. Great convenience, very short waiting times. And because of the higher occupancy, you have much lower prices. I would encourage you to read the reports. They're all downloadable for free from our site. But to give you an idea, on the shared taxi, we come to a price level of 26% of the current price per passenger kilometer in a taxi. On the taxi buses, we come to 30% of the current price of public transport and without the need for any subsidy. So much, much more efficient. These are on the individual scale. 
If you look at the social scale, what we have is much lower traffic volumes, congestion, and emissions, something like 35% less. At 35% less vehicle kilometers, there is no congestion. Any traffic engineer can tell you that. Accessibility grows tremendously, not only in average, but also in terms of its equity. And the next slide will show you that. But also another image that is another result that is very important that we can do all of that with less than 4% of the number of vehicles that are currently used in the city. Each of those vehicles makes many more kilometers, but still only 4% of the vehicles. And as a consequence of that, the total parking space required is about 5% of the total parking space used today. For a city like Lisbon, that sees all of the parking at the surface, plus about half of the parking space in buildings. Look now at this graphic on accessibility. The graphic on the left, this is on public transport. So today, buses and metro and walking. And on the right, those taxi buses and the metro and walking. The darker colors mean access to a greater percentage of the jobs in the city. The colors speak for themselves. Maybe it's good to read you a number that is there. The ratio between the, these are cells of 200 meters square. The ratio between the 10th best served cell and the worst, the 10th percent worst served cell today is a whopping 17.3. That's a very inequitable distribution of accessibility. With the system as we propose, it becomes 1.8. No city in the world today comes even close to that. So this is a massive, important measure of social inclusion. The, other, the second important instrument is smart road charging. I told you before, because there will be no fossil fuels coming, or they will be quickly reducing, we need to take a look and change the fiscal regime what we have today in the EU, there is no country in which fuel duties represent less than 6% of the total fiscal collection of the state. This was very nice when it was created because the transaction costs otherwise would have been impossible. Today, we can be much better. So if you have a kilometer-based charge in which the price per kilometer is connected with the quality of service that you provide to the traveler, and that means a price that is related to the level of congestion. You want to have demand management so that you don't have congestion. And you want to align individual behavior with collective interest. So if the vehicle is in non-shareable mode, it will pay much more than if you allow other people to share the ride with you. If you are going to an environmentally sensitive area in the city, for instance, closer to a hospital, it should be more difficult. If you go through a neighborhood, it should be more expensive. So this, is, this includes carbon pricing if there is still carbon in the fuels. But it's much more, much more sophisticated than carbon pricing. Why? Because there is a wider set of objectives. That's a very simple explanation. The third instrument is sustainable urban planning, the land use dimension of it. It's really to go from car-oriented to people-oriented. And for this, you need to have density, but you also need to have functional diversity. You need to have the shops, the services, all of the social fabric in each neighborhood, not just the houses, not just the offices. You have to have good design for the use of the active modes, walking and biking. And you have to have quality of public areas. In all the cities in the world that have gone in this direction, it's been a tremendous success, both in political terms and in economic terms. To do all of this, the key ingredient is coherence. And this is very difficult. Why? Because there will be massive changes at high speed because the technological change will provide cleaner and safer transport, but not enough to ensure better quality of life. And why is it so difficult? Because you have many stakeholders involved. It's not just the city versus the country, or private industry versus public institutions. It's all this division, all many players with stakes in the game. And so you need inclusive political leadership. It's probably the most difficult part here is to get in each of those cities inclusive political leadership. But then we also have the long-term question, decarbonizing transport. And the ITF has launched a project about a year ago dedicated to this. We are an intergovernmental organization in which we now have 59 member countries. We do not want to be prescriptive. We want to help the countries find their own path, 
which is carbon effective and politically acceptable. This is not easy, but we are now uh, already significant progress in the development of our models, and we hope that we will be able to help the countries navigating on this. I'm getting to my time. Just to conclude, we've seen there are common and differentiated challenges depending on the level of income of those countries. We should be using the turbulence that is inevitably coming to move the system in the direction that is socially more adequate and um, sustainable. Three instruments I've talked to you about, shared mobility, smart road charges, and sustainable urban planning. Coherence of actions is essential. But another difficulty is that we have those long-term questions of decarbonizing, and that should not be overwhelming the short-term goals, but neither the other way around. Because if you forget the short-term goals, you lose political acceptance. And if you lose political acceptance, you won't go anywhere. You will be just moving randomly. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.